So I won't do it in this video, but in the next video I will hook up a decoder so that we can uh, look at some of these digital modes. On it. Uh, and if you go to the website, the company website, that explain how the damn thing is made on that. So I've got the gain set for 20. It's pretty low. And as you can see on the screen, I've put in a shift of negative 40 million. That's negative 40 megahertz. So welcome back to the HF upconverter uh, video series. And uh, I did want to show something to you guys before you lost interest and uh, I've taken just the basics and uh, put it on the board so far. Here is our original oscillator that we developed and uh, I have a front end filter that we will develop in this video and then the uh, simple passive mixer going into the uh, smart RTL dongle and uh, that represents a basic first principles up converter. Um, this would work as is probably uh, between 160 meters or 1.8 megahertz up to probably 30 meters with without any other modifications this would work fine for that band. Once you start to get above 10 or uh, you know 10 or 11 megahertz the noise does be begin to come up and you would like to have some better noise figure some amplification in the system. So I'm going to go on with that in, in the next video. But I did want to show you what a basic passive up converter uh, performs like uh, in this video. So we're going to be looking at uh, dealing with some of these toroid inductors I know that you guys hate so much. And uh, the, uh, the passive mixer, somebody was asking uh, what mixer would you use and uh, I kind of like the uh, so this ADE1 mixer is a surface mount mixer basically it's a four diode uh, two transformer type passive ring mixer and this would be a very good choice very inexpensive it's less than a dollar type of part uh, the part I'm using is very simple uh, also it's a level 7 mixer but of course this has a metal case and it probably is a a more expensive mixer but essentially the same thing. So that's what I'd suggest you use uh, if you're going to try to build your own passive up converter like this. Now with a good antenna you can see there's plenty of sensitivity. You don't need any amplifiers, you don't need any post amplifiers. It's just working. I just applied power and it started working. So I'm going to go through how to set the SDR sharp up for shortwave and then we'll go through this slowly. And I wanted to let you see what the basic circuit can do. Just out of the box it's probably better than most of them that you've played with. Here on the Microwave 1 channel I try to keep the projects very simple and this project of course is going into an area of, uh, of RF uh, design and RF construction that is populated by a lot of folks that uh, either have no experience or they have a tremendous amount of experience. I call them the RF professional hams. So I don't want to cross over onto, into that professional area with a project like this. I want to keep it simple. So one thing we can do is we can simply consider that we're working on a project that's below 100 megahertz generally and there's no need to get into counting fractions of dBs and calculating dynamic range and IP3 and noise figure using a complex spreadsheet or some other modeling technique. This is cut and try type electronics here at Microwave One. And for instance we have some some circuit board here that's just a very simple uh, FR4062 and you could go crazy trying to calculate 50 ohm lines and you know 
Uh, rule of thumb, it doesn't matter. Um, we can carve a line on this board using a razor knife or uh, just, uh, you know, making a thin line and it's going to work fine with this circuit. If you want to get religious, a sixteenth of an inch type line is going to give you something around 50 ohms. Uh, 32nd of a line uh, probably going to give you something higher around 100 ohms, but it really doesn't matter. So I'm not going to be calculating out 50 ohm microstrip lines on a circuit like this. We're just going to get in the ballpark and call that good enough. Okay, some of you are asking, how did you make that line? Well, I did it with a razor knife, and I just peeled, peeled, okay, and bingo, 50 ohm line. Um, is it 50 ohms? I don't know, but uh, it's something in the ballpark. This is regular 062 FR4 board. In the end, I don't really care at these frequencies. It's not important, but I did want to... Uh, just show you a technique. The reason I made the strip line end to end is I'm going to develop my filters along here. And then once I have the filters happy, I'll chop in the, uh, the mixer and so on. So let's discuss the uh, idea of making a front end filter for our little converter. Now the filter needs to be able to select just the band that you want. And I've picked uh, the shortwave band between 1.8 megahertz and 30 megahertz as my target frequencies. So I'm going to need a high pass filter to reject the broadcast band and everything below 1.8 megahertz. And I'm going to need a low pass filter to reject everything above 30 megahertz, like the FM band and paging and so on. So using an online tool, I've got a couple of pretty fancy filters here. These are 7th order Chevy Chev filters. And they require quite a few parts. Four capacitors and three inductors each. And I know this is a little bit, uh, a little bit of work. And uh, the values look to be uh, fairly standard, but uh, still. You're going to be hunting around for some values to make a filter of, uh, of this quality. So I selected two types of toroids to make the filters. Could these be made with air wound coils? Yes, they could, but the coils will get rather large. Could they be done with slug tune coils? Absolutely. But I've chosen to use uh, powdered iron uh, cores, uh, specifically uh, some cores uh, that are fairly common in the ham radio world. Um, these are uh, the T37-2 red cores. And I have one of those up on the screen. And this is a, a pretty good size toroid. As you can see, uh, I've won three of them already. And then for the higher frequency low-pass filter, I'm using some smaller toroids. These are T30-6s. The red toroids are most effective between 2 and 30 megahertz for high Q circuits. The yellow cores are more useful above 30 megahertz up to about 100 megahertz. So uh, between these two I think we can come up with uh, these filters. going to have to get some capacitors, and you can use any decent high-Q capacitor, uh, ceramics, uh, silver mica, um, any, any type of uh, good quality, uh, low-value capacitors, and most of these are between uh, 130 picofarads is the lowest value, and the highest value is 1500 picofarads. So, I've prepared our board to be a test plate for these filters. And just for starters, I'm going to put some SMA board launches on each side of this line that I've cut into the board, rather crudely. I'm not that concerned about impedance. Um, is it going to be 50 ohms? It'll be something close to 50 ohms, because I, I know that the uh, 
the factor on this board is around 4 to 5 to 6. I have a certain width and a certain thickness on the board and I think that will come somewhere close to 50 ohms. So I'm going to start carving this up and mounting the filter on here. We'll see if we can get a decent bandpass filter. So this is step one. So I'm using the Booten 250 and uh, this is a, a beautiful bridge for measuring inductors because you can actually measure the inductors at the frequency you're going to use them. I think I have this one set for 40 megahertz and uh, I'm looking to handle these three inductors here. I need a couple of 390 nanohenry chokes and a 430 nanohenry. So that's 0.39 microhenries, 0.43 microhenries, and 0.39. So I'm getting almost exactly 0.39 here with this toroid, which is oh about nine turns. Now if I were to squeeze those turns, the inductance goes up to almost um, 400 to 450 nano, nano henries. And if I separate it, it goes down to about 280. So you have quite a range of adjustment on these inductors. So just saying that put eight turns on this toroid and stick it in the filter doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to give you exactly the inductance you think you're going to have. So when you build a filter, high pass or a low pass, especially a, a Chevy Chev, Chevy Chev type like this, you will have to do a little bit of tuning with a signal generator and a scope or with your network analyzer. It's fairly rare with so few turns to get the inductance right on the nose just by saying put five turns or put ten turns on the core and get repeatability. For those of you who are accomplished builders that have been building QRP rigs and solid state breadboarding for a long time, this is all pretty straightforward, but for people who are new to doing uh, breadboarding with solid state and uh, building filters and making RF oscillators and such. This is uh, rocket science compared to just building something on a board like a crystal radio. So there's a lot of different levels of experience with, uh, with this type of electronics. But basically what I'm doing is I'm using the simple equipment I have here in the lab I'm attempting to measure the filter's passband to see if it's sharp enough to use with the SDR RTL. So with the generator we first are hooking up to a meter and uh, we're trying to figure out if if we can use the the filter so we need to be able to measure the frequency and the amplitude of the signal going through the filter. And um, to start, all I'm using is some pads in between the generator and the, uh, the meter so I can get a background and know if the generator is flat over a reasonable frequency. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to test the low end of the filter. And right now if I wiggle the, the thing between about 2.3 megahertz and 1.7 megahertz or 1.76. That's the low end of the filter. I want to see that basically this meter stays fairly stable. And it does. Now the filter's in line. And uh, you'll notice I have attenuators on each side of the filter. It's always good to properly terminate a filter when you're measuring it. And I have uh, 6 dB attenuators each side, each port. Okay, we'll go up here. Let's see how this thing acts at the edge of the band, the low edge, around 160 meters. We're going to go from around 2 megahertz down towards 1.8 megahertz. Okay, so we're looking at the meter. Going from 2, we're going down. So by 1.74, it's gone down quite a bit. 
So this is a very sharp response. It's got a little ripple on the end too. That's characteristic of a Chevy Chev filter. Now we could tune this if we had a network analyzer or a sweeper and a, a, a scope setup. I'm not going to go that far with this. I just wanted to show you that it's a very sharp filter on the low end. And similarly on the high end, once we get up to 30 megahertz, this thing drops off like a rock. Okay, not actually uh, trusting my RMS voltmeter above about 15 megahertz. Using the scope to measure the frequency around 30 megahertz. And right now we're at 26 in the middle of the CB band. And as we increase the frequency, get a slight peaking, and then she starts to go down. And it continues, and it's, it's gone. So by 37 megahertz, it's off the scale. So this filter is a little more than most people would attempt without good test gear, or at least one of those small uh, software-defined uh, network analyzers. Here's the basic inductor data. For winding the coils on those toroids, I adjusted nothing, got OK results, uh, nothing's optimized, and again, a network analyzer would be a real help. Or at least a generator and a, uh, a good way to uh, measure the RF on the other side. Remember to terminate the filter properly. I used a couple of 6 dB pads. So the initial demo circuit for this video, proving principle, looks like this. Many online projects use this type of circuit pretty much as is. You'll see the filters vary and so on. Some uh, use an active mixer like the uh, SA612 or the 602 uh, Gilbert Cell mixers. Uh, they would certainly be more sensitive because they're uh, low noise devices, but uh, expect a little more overload. As you can see, I'm using a level 7 surplus flat pack ring mixer called the LMX 149. Uh, the popular ADE-1, which is a modern part, is equivalent, but the specs of the 149 uh, that I use actually says it can't work below 10 megahertz. So how am I getting it to work that way? Well, I'm flipping ports by simply using the IF out port, which is specified from DC to 1500 megahertz, as my input port, or my RF port, and the regular RF port as the upconverted output port, or my IF port, we make the mixer work in a way that's not characterized. So I'm using it backwards in effect. There is no data, there's no spec sheet that describes this way of using it. So that's what you're buying, by the way. When you buy a mixer or any RF part, part it isn't really the part you're buying, it's the specification and the testing and the data sheet and all the work that went into developing it. The part works just as well um, in this reverse mode, but you've got no proven data. So using that part backwards like this uh, is a little bit risky, but remember, we're experimenters. Looking at this chart, it sure looks like the ADE-1 is the logical choice. It goes all the way down to 500 kilohertz or 0.5 megahertz. But is it? There's a good chance that the improper parts below would actually outperform the ADE-1 if used in our backward manner. Just something to consider with upconverters. So this is a completely passive type of mixer system. It will be lossy. There's no amplification before the dongle, before the RTL-SDR. So I, I did want to show some progress for this video. And an intermediate step Something to prove principle would be to simply use the passive mixer, the diode ring, with the oscillator that we've already built and the simple filter that we, that we made for the front end. This is a little more work than uh, usually I do on the channel when I'm using some techniques here that may be uh, are a little more advanced than uh, you normally see. Um, we've got the very sharp bandpass filter on the front end of a passive mixer. The passive mixer um, is being fed by that little oscillator that we made at 40 megahertz. I know that the oscillator has more injection power than I need, so I've got a very crude 
3 dB pad made up of these resistors uh, feeding the LO port of the mixer. And then on the output of the mixer, I've got uh, a wideband diplexer. And why do I say wideband? We're trying to pass a fairly wide bandwidth because this is a block up converter. So uh, we've got 30 megahertz to pass. So I'm kind of using uh, a softer diplexer. I have a coil feeding a, well it's a 47 ohm resistor, but call that 50 ohms, that handles the termination at low frequencies down in the shortwave band where we don't want that stuff leaking through and we want a good termination on the mixer. And then on the high side I have a capacitor feeding another 47 ohm resistor that handles everything well above the 70 or 80 megahertz that we're handling. This is a completely passive system. So the diode ring mixer is going to have loss. We know that's about 6 dB of loss. The filter likely has a dB or two of loss. And we're going to have some loss on the output, which is a kind of a termination loss. The mixer does like to be terminated on the uh, output port. So uh, we have pretty good termination with the actual RTL SDR itself in band. But outside of band, how do you terminate the, the mixer port? And the way that's being done is with a high-pass, low-pass type system. The, uh, for the high-pass system, I have a, a very low-value capacitor feeding a resistor. That handles all the frequencies well above the band that we're interested in. So everything above, say, 100 megahertz is well terminated. Then I have a coil that's feeding another resistor. That handles everything below 40 megahertz where we would like the termination to be good all the way down to, to DC. So that's kind of a wideband flavored diplexer, it's called. And that just guarantees that outside the band we're interested in, that the mixer continues to be well terminated. Now there's other things that we should do. We know that the oscillator is not that clean. We probably should have some low-pass filtering or some band-pass filtering here. Uh, feeding the LO port of the mixer. That will come with the design. But I just want to make sure I had something to show you guys in this second video. Uh, it's going to be lossy. It's not going to have a lot of sensitivity. But when we put the HF band into this port, I'm hoping we will get something between 41 or 42 megahertz and probably 80 megahertz on the output that will represent the entire HF spectrum. Okay, let's look at our initial setup. I've got uh, SDR Sharp running on this uh, little netbook and I have an external speaker hooked up. We're looking at the FM band and wideband FM mode. So over here we have our converter. I've got a, uh, my dipole antenna coming in right to the input of the bandpass filter. I have the output of the converter going directly into the SDR Smart and this is an 820 uh, type of front end on there. We're going to have to do a little bit of work in SDR Sharp to put in the 40 megahertz offset so that this starts to tune in the HF spectrum instead of up, up in the VUHF. Also you see I have my power supply set for 12 volts. We'll be attaching power to the oscillator and seeing if we're going to get some HF signals through our passive system. Now with a good antenna, you can see there's plenty of sensitivity. You don't need any amplifiers, you don't need any post amplifiers. It's just working. I just applied power and it started working. So I'm going to go through how to set the SDR Sharp up for shortwave. And then we'll go through this slowly. And I wanted to let you see what the basic circuit can do. So here's the 19 meter band on a Sunday afternoon. Now you can 
see fairly easily here on this time signal CHU that we're slightly off frequency. We can put a correction in parts per million in to correct the frequency. Or I can put a trimmer on the crystal of the oscillator and bring the crystal frequency right on frequency. So those are the two methods of getting the system calibrated. So this is a 20 meter band on a simple uh, one wavelength loop antenna in the backyard. Loop antenna in the backyard cut for 20 meters. <clears throat> and of course, with a cut antenna, you not only do a pretty good job bringing in signals on the band, but you also reject a lot of the other signals that are out of the band. So this is another reason why using a tuned antenna makes such a big difference, not only in terms of hearing signals, but in keeping the signals you don't want out of the picture. Okay, so the most important thing that you need to put in is the offset. 40 megahertz is our local oscillator, so we're going to put in negative 4 with 8 zeros in back of it. Okay, up here in the shift, you want that checked. Now, it'll, it'll memorize that, so when you uncheck it, it goes back to the VUHF mode. But when you check this, it'll put that shift in for our particular local oscillator, which is 40 megahertz. The other thing that's interesting, uh, we go up here to settings, is the kind of gain that you set. This is going to vary with the mode. Depending on the mode that you want to run, you're going to, you're going to adjust this Bring it up, bring it down. If you bring it too low, as you can see, the signal will go into the noise. Sometimes you can use automatic gain control. It works pretty well with AM. When the band is busy, it tends to overload the, the dongle. But with AM, it seems to work pretty well. And finally, I want to show you the frequency correction in parts per million. We've got three parts per million in, basically, puts these guys right on 3885 kilohertz. So this is uh, CHU Canada 3.330. As you can see, it's low in frequency. So basically, this is because our crystal over here is low in frequency as well, so we would need to put a trimmer on this crystal to raise its frequency. That would be one way to bring this in. Another way is to correct using the program in parts per million right here. So I'm going to put in one part per million. That brought it closer. Two parts per million. Three. Three is just about perfect. If I go too far, four brings me over, so I'm going to keep it at three. That's as close as I can get with the program. The crystal frequency was low and we were thinking of putting a capacitor in series with the crystal. Capacitor in series with the crystal raises its frequency and it would do this correction quite easily. So I uh, did the frequency correction again and uh, this only needed three parts per million uh, tonight. As I'm on uh, WWV at 10 megahertz and uh, it only required three parts per million of correction. So here's WWV at 5 megahertz at night and uh, pretty close to on frequency. I am going to put a trimmer on the uh, oscillator once I rebuild it onto the board. So SDR Sharp works pretty well. Um, with the converter. I will say that uh, the program is, is free from AirSpy and it works with uh, 
almost all PCs nowadays. You don't need a really powerful machine to run it. Uh, the 32-bit version of it seems to run okay on uh, most machines. I have found that uh, Windows 10 is not as stable uh, with this program with some of the dongles as it should be. And uh, it'll run, but uh, sometimes when you stop it, it won't start up again. You have to restart the program. And I think it has a lot to do with the updates that are happening with Windows 10 all the time. But really, uh, the conversion comes down to uh, simply setting the offset properly and then the parts per million uh, to line up the oscillator. And it pretty much uh, does what adver what's advertised. So in the next video, we're going to take this circuit and uh, dress it out a little bit with some amplification and some improved filtering, especially on the output of the mixer. And we'll see if we can uh, get the performance to the point where uh, maybe we have a good schematic and a good product to try to reproduce.